conviction of faith, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. All of our believers, let's greet each other. Let us not live like religious people. And with this, the title today is Let Us Not Misunderstand. So this is something that happened in a company copy room. And so a female employee who did not have a boyfriend entered the copy room and saw the most handsome male employee in the company making copies. And so as soon as she entered the room, she felt like her heart was pounding. And suddenly that male employee who was very handsome looked at her and said, I'm halfway done, which in Korean actually sounds the herd. It actually sounds the same as I fell in love with you. And so this female employee was very shocked and her eyes widened. And at that moment, the male employee said, I'm almost done with the other half. I'll be done soon. So I'm not, I'm realizing that not a lot of adults are laughing at this joke. But actually, it was the misunderstanding of this female employee. So the term misunderstanding refers to interpreting or understanding something differently from the literal facts. But this misunderstanding actually happens quite frequently in our lives, and it causes many issues in our lives, even causing rifts in relationships. If you look closely at marital fights, they often start with minor misunderstandings leading to bigger fights. And it's not that the one person is wrong, it is that they are simply different. But there's no peace in that household because they keep saying that the other person is wrong. And so this perpetuates even more misunderstandings. So everyone comes from different cultural backgrounds. And from what I can see, people are so different. And they're different according to their regions as well. Especially in our church, we have many people that come from the region of Cholado. And I, when I see the report for the flesh and bone evangelism movement, there's so many Cholado family members. And I say, why are there so many Cholado people on this list that we need to evangelize? And it's because people in that region. They're very family oriented. Whereas in the region of Gyeongsan-do, people, they don't talk to each other much. And they, it feels like they're very quick-tempered. And they talk very loudly. And so when other people hear people from Gyeongsang-do speaking, it sounds like they're trying to fight with you. But they're just speaking normally. And that's something that I can't even fix to this day. I'm just talking normally and people say, why are you yelling? And I just say, I'm just talking. And so these cultural differences, they, it's hard to solve them. And so they cause misunderstandings because people's cultures are different. And so their way of expressing things is different. And especially for people from Chungcheong-do, they don't express much. So you don't know what they're trying to say. You don't know what they're thinking because they don't express anything. And so people also judge according to their own thoughts and they misunderstand and then they become hurt. And there's an old saying that means even if someone speaks with nonsense, understand it like it makes sense. And this is an expression that actually causes more misunderstanding. It is completely unreasonable to expect something to be understood when someone is speaking nonsense. So are you talking nonsense and hoping to be understood? If you speak nonsense, the other person will understand nonsense. That's what is normal. 
and therefore it is crucial to communicate in a way that avoids misunderstandings, even if you say one, one word. And this is especially the case with people that we are close to, the people that you meet often. You need to be careful about your words. And you need to keep your manners. You can't think, oh, they'll understand, they know my personality. Because that will cause mistakes the closer you are. And so in my case, when I meet my closest friends, I'm very careful, even though I'm closest to them, the closer I am. So I'm so very extra careful at home as well. My family, my children, I'm most careful around them because I'm most close to them. When I was younger, I didn't do this because I thought they're my wife, they're my family. But as I grew older, I realized I shouldn't do that. Within the gospel, the closest people, you need to be careful and you need to keep your manners. And that's the life of an elite. So speaking thoughtlessly, people will be hurt because of you and will bring more misunderstandings. And the reason why I'm saying this is because even in a spiritual life, there are many cases of misunderstandings. And especially if you do not properly understand the truth of the Bible and spiritually misunderstand it due to mishearing or prejudices and stereotypes and fixed ideas, you'll not be able to grow in your faith or have any spiritual influence. And you might think, oh, all churches are like this. I'm not going to go to church anymore. There are many people that are like that. And they say, I went to church, but because of this minister, because of this elder, because of this other person, I was hurt. And I don't go to church anymore. There's so many people like that. I receive reports. And I see people who don't go to church for 10 years because they were hurt from some other church and they recently came to our church. There's so many people like that, people who receive scars in the church. And so their faith does not grow. So they sit here and they listen to the message, but their faith doesn't grow. And especially these days, there are a lot of cults or heresies in our church. And we have the Shincheonji and the Church of God associated with An Sangong and Jehovah's Witnesses. And so these misled believers with unbiblical doctrines, they come into the church and they tailor the Bible to their own taste and make people misunderstand it. So they just understand the Bible according to their own taste and standards, and they take apart the Bible and take out what they don't need and just focus on the points that relate to them. That's so easy to misunderstand. And they say all these churches, they're wrong. And of course, churches have their own problems, but they say and they point out these problems, and so people are easily deceived. And so everyone who receives scars from original churches, they then go to these heresies. You must not be deceived. So in today's passage, an individual that is within spiritual misunderstanding appears. And so this person did not know the true walk of faith that God rejoices in and had a major misunderstanding. However, despite meeting Jesus in person, he unfortunately failed to resolve the misunderstanding. Even after meeting Jesus, he couldn't understand. And so it is one of the most tragic scenes in the Bible. And so this person had a critical misunderstanding about two things. And one was about eternal life. It was about eternal life, and the second was about materialistic things. They're very important things in eternal life and materialistic things. 
And so these two things become the main channels of attack by Satan for believers. And if there are misunderstandings about these two areas, then one cannot receive salvation or blessings. So Satan continues to launch all-out attacks to keep people among these misunderstandings. So may all believers of Yewon Church have the opportunity to clear up any misunderstandings hindering their spiritual growth through today's word. So I pray that you may accurately discern the will of God according to what the Bible says and really establish a firm partisan of the word within yourself. Really have the partisan of the word. It is because your, the word is weak inside of you and you have not imprinted the word inside of you that you crumble down. The people that do not experience growth in their faith, no matter how long they have been within their walk of faith, it's because they do not have the word inside of them. And a characteristic of these people is they cannot do spiritual forum. They cannot do forum because there's nothing inside of them. You need to have the word so that you can go out into the field and do tarakbang and ministry. And so then you just end up becoming a churchgoer. But the Bible doesn't talk about churchgoers. The Bible talks about disciples. It talks about the community of disciples. So who's a churchgoer? Just people who go to and from church. The people who just go to church because it relieves their heart. But disciples, they cannot stay still. Whoever they meet, they throw the lifeline. They have no choice but to deliver the gospel. That's a very big difference. And there are still many people who are within spiritual misunderstanding and engaging in religious activities and who are wandering aimlessly without knowing the true way of salvation, heading towards eternal destruction. There are so many unbelieving souls like that. So I bless you in the name of the Lord to become absolute disciples of Christ who go beyond this and really have the heart of giving the accurate gospel to these people. So the first main point, the misunderstanding about eternal life. Verse 17 reads, And as he was sitting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? As Jesus was walking along the road, a man approached him and knelt down before him and asked the question. He asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So according to this passage, this man was very wealthy. And in Matthew chapter 19, we can see that he was a young adult. And in Luke 18, he was referred to as a ruler. So in other words, he had, he was young and he had a high position or a good job in society. And in other words, he was equipped with all the conditions that people in the world might envy because he was young with wealth, honor, and power, and he seemingly lacked nothing. And however, just because he had, the, had these things, it did not mean that he lived rashly. He was a model young adult who was born into a traditional Jewish, Jewish family and had diligently observed the law since childhood. And so in a recent young adult special lecture, I used the terms hakike, which is an abbreviation for a Korean word meaning a fraud character. And it doesn't mean a character who cheats, but it is a new term used to describe someone who is truly talented in many areas, to the point that they seem like a fake person. So in the past, we used the term jack of all trades. These days, we say the words hakike. And so in short, this young man in the passage today was like a hakike, so he was perfect in every way. However, this young man had a hidden concern inside, inside of him. He was experiencing a spiritual emptiness inside of himself that could never be filled with the worldly wealth and honor or power that he had. And it's not just him, it's everybody else as well. 
no matter how well you are doing in the world. Whether you're a leader, a politician, a celebrity, a sportsman, they seem so astounding and great. That's not the case. You shouldn't look at those people like that. These days in the Sky Art Hall on Friday and Saturday as well, I don't know if it was an actor or a singer, but there were so many people lined up to take a glimpse at his face. I don't even know, know that person, but they said he's so famous and he's so handsome. And so it was filled with no empty seats because they wanted to see that person. And a famous philosopher Pascal said, he said, God made a void in the human heart that nothing can fill. And so Pascal is a philosopher. He is such a smart person who studied a lot. He has a lot of knowledge and he's very famous as well. But he said, there is a void in the human heart. So that even if we try to fill it with worldly things, it cannot be filled. What should we fill it with? The Word of God. We need to meet God. And that's why young people and stars and celebrities, they keep causing issues. Even though they have such great fame and money, they feel emptiness. And so they turn to drugs because they want to fill that void. This empty space was created by God and it cannot be filled by anything else. How do we fill it? There's only one way, which is by meeting God. We must meet God through Jesus Christ. Only then will that void be filled. And so this young man in the passage was troubled by the fact that he could not fill this void through how he had lived his life up until that point. And so he was wondering about this and then hearing about Jesus, he came to him and kneeling down, he asked him. And so this very well-off man, it's not easy for him to be kneeling down before someone else. And so he had a very respectful and very earnest attitude. And so he asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What can I do to fill this void inside of me? And so this young man was wondering and had questions about the concept of eternal life, but he had greatly misunderstood the concept of eternal life because he thought that eternal life could be obtained through good deeds or his own efforts. That was the prejudice that he had. And this was not just a problem of this individual. It was a common belief among the Jews of that time. And even now among religious people, a lot of people believe this. So when evangelizing, we often encounter people who respond in this way. Especially people who are really kind. So people who are really kind within Catholic religion or Buddhism, they're very kind, but they think like this. However, Jesus points out that this way of thinking is incorrect before God. Verse 18 reads, And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And so this statement indicates that the young man's understanding of goodness is flawed. The good that this young man thought or emphasized was focused on actions or behavioral aspects. However, Jesus points out that this was wrong and that it was wrong because they were not aligned with God's standards. It's not God's standard. Being good or doing good deeds is not God's standard of gaining eternal life. God's absolute standard for us to attain eternal life is 
only through Jesus Christ. Good deeds, it's great. However, it has nothing to do with salvation. No matter how good you are, no matter how kind you are, you cannot receive salvation through good deeds. It is only through Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it clearly states that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All people, all mankind, we are sinners, and so we cannot reach the glory of God. Whether it is the Pope, or a pastor, or a gangster, or a prostitute, and people in prison, everyone is the same. We are all sinners. So I am good? So how good can you be? People break the worldly law and they end up in prison, but we're all the same. We are all sinners. You must know that. People who think, I'm cleaner than you, you become conceited that way. And you're judging. It's a very funny thing to say. How could you criticize other people? Because it says, all have sinned. And in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, it says that all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. And so look at, look at priests. They say, I'm different from you. So how different can you be? Someone who fixes shoes or someone who goes up the mountain to pray, everyone is the same. So when I was just a lay believer, I went up into the mountain to pray, not just in the prayer um, building, but beyond that there was this cave in the mountain where we would pray. And so people would occasionally put water there. And so you were just there at the top of the mountain praying. And so you don't eat and you've prayed in the mountain. And so it feels like you have a really clear mind. And so then I came to church after that, and I was at the Wednesday worship, and I felt like everyone else at the church was lesser than me. And so really going into fasting and receiving grace through prayer, it was really easy for me to become conceited. And so it felt like I was so holy and my mind was so clear. That holiness didn't even last a week. So to be good before God, the problem of sin must first be resolved. And so it is important that we accurately recognize the biblical definition of eternal life through the word today. In Titus chapter 1 verse 2, it reveals that eternal life was promised before the ages began by God who never lies. And so eternal life was not something created by mankind, but it was created by God who had the eternal plan. As well as this in John chapter 17, verse 3, it has the overall definition of eternal life. It says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is eternal life. It is to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ. And in this context, to know does not simply mean understanding through knowledge. It means a unification through faith. And furthermore, in Titus chapter 3, verses 5 to 7, it reveals that this eternal life is not given through any works of mankind. It says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 
And so it proclaims that the hope of eternal life that we have is not achieved by our actions, but through the atonement and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. And above all, in John chapter 3, verse 16, it says that we receive the blessing of eternal life when we simply believe in only Jesus Christ, regardless of any other conditions, as soon as we believe in Jesus Christ. And you become righteous through faith. But what does the world say about this? What does the religion say? They say, isn't there more than one way to reach the summit of a mountain? They say there are various ways to reach the summit of a mountain. And it's religious pluralism. Many people are deceived by this. On Friday, through the message titled, I Must See Rome Also, I gave the sermon. I said the greatest masterpiece that Satan has created is the Catholic religion. And so people are easily deceived by this Catholic religion. People feel like they need to go to church, and so they go to church. But then there are pastors who talk about offerings and church construction and all of that and various problems. And so they become tired of the church. And then they go to the Catholic religion where it feels like the same church and yet there's a sense of silence. And they think it talks about the same God, it talks about Jesus, and it feels very comfortable. And so they feel like it's very nice to go there and it feels like a nice atmosphere. It's the greatest masterpiece of Satan. And that's why this entire world and Europe, they go into the Catholic religion. And so it's either the Orthodox Church that they created in Russia or it's the Catholic religion. And so they've created so many churches. However, there's no actual proper church within the Protestant, within Protestantism. And so many people are deceived by this, and especially elites as well, because it's so different to a church. And yet, is there salvation? There is no salvation. It's a religion of idol worship. They have so many statues. I heard some people said, how come Yewon Church doesn't have a cross? Because even a cross symbol, it's an idol. Looking towards a cross statue, that's, that's an idol. So just look to Jesus Christ. That's why I don't have one in the church. Of course, it would look good to have one. But it said in the Bible, do not make idols or statues. So how could a church raise up a statue of their senior pastor? That, that's, that's a way for the church to crumble down. And so you must really be well informed about the difference between religion and the gospel. So religion emphasizes the works of human. That's why you bow down to different idols. And it is a, achieving something through my own efforts. It's what the young adult in the sermon is saying. It's complete opposite to the gospel. It's complete humanism. The gospel was not given based on any human actions, but through the absolute grace of God. And so eternal life is a gift from God. And God chose this way so that not one person could boast about it. No one can say, I did this and I did so much devotion, I did so much efforts, I did so much fasting so that I could receive this. No one can say that. 
What was the reason that God did this? It is so that we do not look to people who are incomplete. And you might think when you look at someone, how could they do that? They can do that. And so you can say, oh, this is why it's only Christ. So only look to Jesus Christ. And it says in the Bible, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is His is in his son whoever has the son has life whoever does not have the son of God does not have life it is very simple those who have the son of God what do they have they have life do you have the son of God and that's why the acceptance movement is important not just doing it without thinking but really knowing the meaning behind the acceptance But there are too many souls in the field right now who are being deceived and they misunderstand that salvation is in other things that are not Christ. So right now we have so many cults and heresies that are misleading and deceiving people. There are so many people that are within those heresies. And this is why we are unfolding the Start 10,000 2025 movement that enlarges the place of our four main tents. And so the next Lord's Day is the D-Day of the short-term absentees and newcomers invitation camp that the province committee is currently proceeding with. And so I'm sure many believers are already participating, but really may all of you make a covenantal challenge in concentration this week. To the people around you, to the unbelieving souls around you, really give the gift of eternal life to them. And really have the assurance as you give it to them. Only when you accept Jesus Christ, Even if you are a murderer, you can receive salvation. That's how you evangelize in prison. And so I really bless in the name of the Lord that you'll be able to enlarge the tents of your fields. The second main point, the misunderstanding about materials. Verse 21 reads, And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And so to the young man that was within the misunderstanding of thinking he could gain eternal life through his own good deeds, Jesus asked one decisive question. Jesus already saw through this young adult's heart. And so although seemingly perfect externally, he knew that this man's heart was captivated by none other than materialistic things. And so the one thing lacking from this young adult was that he loved materials more than God. And so Jesus urged this young adult to no longer be bound by materials going forward and to change his priorities. But verse 22 says, he was disheartened by the saying, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So Jesus said, sell all you have and give to the poor. But he has great positions. And so he might think, I spent my whole life for these materials and gathering these materials. And so it's really a pitiful moment in the Bible because he was so miserable. So is God your priority or is the materials your priority? Is God your priority or is people your priority? You have to make that decision. So as we give worship, our parking lots, our parking spaces, we don't have much parking space. And so I can see from... 30 minutes before the worship, I see so many cars and it's already all filled, the parking lot. And so they really park in all the small spaces that they can. And so the workers and ministers and elders who work to manage the traffic and the cars and the parking, they're really devoted because it's such a difficult work to do. And so I always pray in Thanksgiving. And I say, Father God, thank you for the workers that are devoting themselves for the traffic and the car parking work in a place where they're not seen by other people or they're not, they don't receive any kind of glory. And rather, people treat them unkindly sometimes. 
Of course, all people want to look good before people. It's not fun if nobody knows the work that we're doing. However, the people that are in those places doing the unseen works, they're the most precious. And do you even know who does these flower arrangements? They're working since Friday for these arrangements. And so really, what is your priority? Is God your priority? Or is your children your priority? For this young adult, he chose his positions before God. And to those who really experience having a lot of materials and position, they can't even spend it. It's rather the people that don't have much that spend it because they think, I don't have much anyway, I can just spend it. And so the... The disabled people that live nearby who have been given these apartments to them, they spend a lot because they think, I don't have much anyway. It's rather the people who have a lot in high society that they don't, they don't spend much. And so to this man, when he was faced with the question of whether it was his materials or eternal life, he chose his materials. To us, as we watch, it sounds like such a pitiful decision. Just because you choose eternal life, does that mean God will make you live a life in poverty? That's not the case. This young, young man chose his materials. And so this was the idol that he could not let go of. So he could do everything else but not give up his materials. And so what is the one thing that you lack? What is the one thing that takes highest priority in your heart above Jesus Christ? So what is the one thing that you are lacking? Is it materials like this rich young man in the passage? Or is it honor, knowledge, power, reputation, or your own children? And so the method to feel that one inadequacy is not somewhere else, but it is actually in letting go of that very idol that you are holding on to. And so for a lot of parents, their children are their idols. And they want their children to become someone grand in this world. And they believe that they will. But really, put that all down. You must let that go. Why is your faith not growing? In verse 23, Jesus says after the young rich man left, he said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And he even stated the analogy, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So he's explaining that material serves as a large obstacle in the path of gaining eternal life. And that's why we have finished church construction. But really, it was a way for God to continuously test us. And this word does not mean that all rich people cannot go to heaven. And it does not mean that poor people automatically enter heaven. It means that a person who relies on and serves or loves materials more than God, those who reckon money as God, cannot find the answer to eternal life. That's what he is saying. We must clearly remember that there is nothing more important than the matter of salvation and the matter of eternal life as we live on this earth. And following Mark chapter 9, verse 43, Jesus warns us about hell by making a fearsome analogy. He says, And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. 
He is saying the punishment of hell is as fearful as such. And so this warning about hell that Jesus made clearly goes beyond a mere warning. It is also a message that awakens us. It is that we who became children of God, our urgent mission is the mission of saving lives. And so for the evangelization of 237 nations and 5,000 tribes, we have organized teams for each 237 nation. And we have started the 237 Start On to make each team see and pray for the mission field correctly and open doors to each country. And so we are to take on the challenge of realistically raising a partisan in each nation by forming a mission association of each respective nation. And so really, on the third Sunday of each month, we will hold Thanksgiving services to organize national missionary associations, form networks, and develop specific mission roadmaps. So please pay attention to the announcements in the weekly bulletin, and may you all participate if you have picked a particular country. And so God raised up this church so that we will gather together. And so today the Bali camp team is leaving. And they're not going because they have a lot of time and a lot of money. They're people that made the resolution. And I saw their schedule and it was so fully packed. And I saw that they go back to back to the place that they're staying at 1 a.m. and then their next day schedule starts at 7 a.m. And I was so surprised by this busy but perfect schedule that they had. And so they had communicated with the Bali church already. And so in order to proclaim the gospel, they're going to the land of Indonesia. What's the reason that they're doing that? So believers, really set your priorities. Really set your priority according to the word of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, and really have the evidence of receiving and enjoying the blessing that God adds to our lives. So this is the conclusion, verse 29 to 30 reads, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. And so in short, this word emphasizes that you must have a clear priority. God never lets the life that sets spiritual priority to be in vain. He always repays a life that has the correct spiritual priority. And this blessing is so great. It is a complete blessing. And so he says, I will let, let you live a life that is completely guaranteed. And it talks about ha having a hundredfold of answers. And so really, I bless all Yawan believers in the name of the Lord to have the evidence of receiving and enjoying these guaranteed blessings through the covenantal challenges. Father God, at this time we have received the word. Please let us be able to go beyond our misunderstandings of eternal life and of materialistic things and let us become the people of God and the disciples of God who go forward with only the gospel. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.